a button to continue so you can be part of the conversation. Okay. And we will kick off our last session, the fourth session of the Southwest Ohio um, Virtual Perennial School with Joe Boggs from Hamilton County. Take it away, Joe. Thanks a lot, Gigi. Now, some of you, this is one of those uh, presentations where if you go back last year, I actually did a very similar presentation because, and I'm repeating it for two reasons. Number one, or, you know, is to include some updates, but also because as Gigi and I talked about this, this is a topic that, uh, that quite honestly, sometimes requires a couple of different passes for us all to grasp, including myself. You're gonna learn this in just a little bit. This topic was something that I should have known about for years and actually just didn't process what was actually going on before my eyes. So brings me to the first point. And that is, let's face it, insects suffer from a serious image problem. We often just view insects as pests. You know, I mean, here's a nice home and we have a few insects that show up, a few more insects and then things that eat insects and things we're not really sure what they are. And of course, that can lead to panic. And then the first option, we call this off the shelf pest management. And let's face it, very often, and I mean, we, Gigi and I get questions sometimes about people wanting to spray to kill a beneficial insect. But let's consider some different perspectives. Now, this is a pretty obvious perspective. Um, and that is, when I use the words flitter and flutter, what comes to mind? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Relative to insects, I think the first thing, wait a minute, I, somebody is controlling my, uh, Gigi, did you? Are you still there, Gigi? Yeah, I'm here, but I didn't do anything. Well, I got a, a message. I have a bad feeling. I got a message to ask about somebody controlling uh, this presentation, and I clicked on yes, uh, unfortunately. Do you all see the presentation again? No, it's gone. All right. Um, I'm sorry for this. We're going to have to, uh, I've stopped sharing. All right. So I'm now going to share again and hopefully I think that may have just been an error, hopefully. So let's see how things work this time. Hang on, I'm gonna get rid of the black box. All right, are we good? Are we good, Gigi? Do you see everything? Yep. All right. I see it. All right, so when I use the words flitter and flutter, um, let's consider that relative to insects. What do we think about with insects? Well, we think about things like butterflies and moths, these two butterflies in particular. I mean, monarch has become, monarch butterflies have almost become the poster child for butterflies, right? The point being is insects are beneficial because they do add animated beauty to the landscape. You know, this is something that actually, again, didn't come to me until, you know, late in my extension career to realize that, okay, we go out and view a flower garden and, and the flowers are, are beautiful and we're enjoying the flowers, but what draws our attention very often to those flowers when we see something like a red admiral flittering around and fluttering around and even the underside of this butterfly is beautiful. So they do add animated beauty to the landscape. They're pollinators. Of course, that's the subject of today's presentation. We do know that one third of our food supply depends directly on plant pollinators. We know this to be true. I'm gonna cite some research that clearly demonstrates that. However, how many of you heard this a different way? One of every three bites of food depend on bees. That's a lot different than pollinators, right? Depends on bees. Well, it still goes on and I'm not denigrating any of the uh, of, of the groups I'm going to show here, because I used to echo that. I used to, my some of my older presentations, I would make that statement. 
Same idea. Believe it or not, you have a bee to thank for every one of in three bites of food you eat. One of every three or four, they're kind of hedging their bets of food you eat is thanks to bees. Huff posts, one of every three bites of food depends on bees. Let's save them. I love the Sierra Club, but one third of our food supply relies on a very sick species, honeybees. One third of our food supply. I hate to tell you this, but that's fake news. Now, it's not fake news on purpose. You know, we have that perception, but we're all guilty you know, of delivering fake news. Sometimes we do it just simply because we don't know better. And I will tell you that, again, I used to teach the same idea. I used to do the same thing because I thought it to be true. But then I've learned something about this. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. This is one of my favorite presentations, and I'm going to date myself. Just the facts. That's what we should be dealing with. And you can all learn firsthand the facts. If you've never used Google Scholar, I'm hoping that this will highlight a very helpful tool because Google Scholar, if you do a search, what comes up are only scientific papers. You don't get magazine articles. You don't get newspaper articles. It has to be peer-reviewed research results. So like, for example, if I typed in, which I did, importance of pollinators, well, here's a paper that came up, importance of pollinators in changing landscapes for world crops, 2006. And so let's go there. Now it turns out this paper, and of course this is the downside of not acquiring firsthand, reading the papers for yourself. It turns out this paper is generally viewed as the source of that one in three bites of food, thank a bee fake news. And you think, wait a second, Joe, you, you're saying that, you know, we should be citing this paper, but you're also saying that uh, well, it's responsible for this fake news. Well, the fake news came about because people interpreted this paper for their own usage, in my opinion, or maybe they just misunderstood. I don't know, but this paper does not say that. So at one, on one side, it may be responsible for that misconception, myth conception, I should say. On the other side, it should be responsible for correcting it. So what does it say? 60% of global production comes from crops that do not depend on animal pollination. Well, that's pretty interesting. 35% from crops that depend on pollinators. That's the one in three, roughly. That's where that came from. And this is really pretty unassailable. If you read this paper, you'll find, yes, they, this is well supported in their data. But the paper goes on to say, to cite animals such as insects, including bees, as well as birds and bats. So what happened to the birds and bats? Well, I contend bees have enjoyed a better marketing campaign. So let's get back to this. One third of our food supply does depend directly on plant pollinators, but we have a lot of different plant pollinators. So just to kind of zero in on this a little bit more, I have this mildly taxing taxonomy. Of course, we teach this in our classes, our master gardener classes. Uh, the master gardeners are on here. This is not new. And many of you have come across taxonomy. I'm sure it's a very important point. <clears throat> Actually, something that even if you're not a master gardener, you should look into because it's very important to understand taxonomy is all about relationships, for example. And uh, sometimes these relationships are extremely important, in particular, not to go too far off the subject, in particular in host selection by pests, for example, because very often, you know, a pest selecting a particular tree or shrub is based on the taxonomy and whether or not it gets on others that are closely related may be surprising, but in this case, I have four of the major insect orders. In fact, if you go out, you know, when it's a little bit warmer and look and, and find insects, there's a high probability you will find insects that belong in one of these four orders. And it turns out with insects, the order level in taxonomy is the ma major level of separation. You're all taxonomists, frankly, because I think you all recognize this as a fly. And even the name of the order clearly demonstrates it's a fly. 
and I'm going to give you some rules. P-T-E-R-A means wing. With wing, actually, is another way of putting it. What does die mean? Two. Flies only have two wings. That P-T-R-A accounts for why pterodactyl starts with a P. Pterodactyl actually means winged fingers. Coleo, coleoptera. What does coleo? Coleo means sheath wing. The first wings, the front wings, are hardened into these sheaths that cover the hind wings and the abdomen. Lepido means scale wing. You've all maybe experienced this. You know the coloration on butterflies and moths rubs off. It's the scales that give them the color. So you have the name of the order actually describing what's in the order. And I think that's a pretty neat thing with insects. It makes life a little bit easier. But let's examine specifically one of these orders, diptera, green bottle fly. Now, once I started really becoming interested in pollinators, of course, as you, I mean, I think almost every photograph you're gonna see or, or pictures I've taken. So I started photographing a lot of pollinators to help with my teaching. And something that kept happening would be I'd be taking pictures of flowers and these darn flies would be there and I'd shoo them away. A green bottle fly, I mean, oh my gosh, the larvae, these are carrion flies. The larvae feed on decaying meat. I mean, you know, look at this thing. I mean, I called them the green photo bomber fly because they just kept showing up and it'd be like, oh gosh, you know, I'd shoo them away because I wanted to take a picture of a real pollinator, right? Until I came across this paper. Diptera are the second most important order of flower visiting and flower pollinating insects worldwide. This was all the way back in 2001. I should have known, I didn't know. It gets even better, here's another one. In that same proceedings B, I should have pointed that out. This is a very important scientific publication. If you get published in this, you're, you've really arrived. The forgotten flies, the importance of non-surfid, surfid flies or hover flies, are important pollinators, but they're also very important in terms that their larvae are predators. But look at this, the importance of non surfid diptera as pollinators. Again, 2015. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying that flies are turning out to be extremely important pollinators, but they don't carry the same cachet as bees, do they? They just don't. So want the facts? trust science. If we go and reorder the pollinators, the most important order for, for, for insect pollinators continues to be hymenoptera, bees and wasps. That remains true. But now based on what I've presented, what's the second most in order? Second most important order, it's flies. Flies are more important than Lepidoptera. Flies are more important than monarch butterflies. And of course, they're more important than coleoptera, than beetles. So let's kind of examine what does this mean now? Well, what this means is this is more false insect marketing. The butterfly garden it should be called the fly garden. Now, I realize, okay, I've gone maybe one step too far, right? But my point to you is <clears throat> don't let our own perceptions color what we believe to be true. You know, seek the truth on your own. Our perceptions are flies are bad. They buzz around us, the carrion flies, oh my gosh, all that. But in, as it turns out, they are very important relative to insect pollination. And this whole examination is starting us to exam, is, is causing scientists to examine the entire array of pollinators and our perception. For example, and I don't want to rain on anyone's pride, I love monarch butterflies. And of course, they're very important insects and you know they are tremendously fascinating, but how important are they as pollinators? You know, some believe that certain butterflies are actually nectar thieves. Now remember how plant nectar works. Plant nectar is actually a bribe. It's the bribe the plant produces for free because they just simply, you know, plants have this wonderful ability, you know, called photosynthesis where they can take the elements provided by oxygen and carbon dioxide and break them apart, reform them into using the energy of the sun, reform them into food, sugar. Well, 
the idea then is that nectar is free. It doesn't cost the plant anything to produce. So, you know, somewhere along the lines, plants started producing, using this nectar to bribe things, insects and other animals to come in. You get a little sweet treat if you will take my pollen over there. Well, if you look at this monarch, what do you see? You see the proboscis, the feeding, which is like, I need to get one of these. The, the proboscis of butterflies is just exactly, if you picture in your mind, that party favor that you blow one, of, you know, and it unwinds and you get a little noise. I need to get one of those so I can do that in my talks. That's how it works. So if you can see in both cases, the proboscis is going down into the flower, but look at these stilted legs sticking up there. Are, are, is this monarch picking up any pollen from these flowers? Now, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. All Lepidoptera are not equal. This little skipper is covered in pollen. It's much deeper into the flower. And if we look at, you know, once again, yes, I am not denigrating bees as being important pollinators, but I am pointing out that they do some things differently. I love to watch bumblebees feed because they just stick their whole head way down into the flowers. They do this all the time, sometimes their whole body. And they get covered. Look at all the little the pollen stuck to this bumblebee. And that's a carpenter bee, bumblebee. I don't, I'm not sure here. But the point of it is, is this group of bees are very important because they get right into the flower. They fully buy into the bribe. They fully buy into spreading around pollen. More fascinating pollen, pollen, pollinator facts. Sorry for that. I hope you've all had your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> carnivore incognito so let's dig into this a little deeper and this is going to be a common theme here with this presentation this is called the blue winged wasp Hulia dubia and it is a solitary ectoparasite now you can see here's a female and she's really digging into the flower all the pollen stuck on her she's a great pollinator but she will then use the nectar as a food source, she doesn't feed on pollen. She uses the nectar as an energy source so she can fly off and find a white grub that would normally develop into a green June beetle. And she lays a single egg on that white grub. When that egg hatches, it's the wasp larvae bores in and feeds and kills the white grub. What am I saying to you? It's a, she's a twofer. She's a pollinator and an enemy of an insect pest. This is going to be, as I said, a recurring theme. So we've already introduced this concept. Insects are beneficial because they are predators and parasitoids. They prey upon other insects. I love this quote. The whole of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat and the active and the passive. <laughs> Think about that a little bit. So a little short segue. We're going to dig a little deeper into this whole thing of entomophagous insects. I want to do this just so that we're on the same page with some of the terminology I'm going to be using. Entomophagous, entomo means arthropods, including insects. Phage comes from the Greek phagian, meaning to eat. So entomophagous insects are insects that eat other insects. And of course, we have these terms that you're very familiar with. A predator consumes a host from the outside. It kills the host. I think all of you know these are insect predators, lady beetle, Mantids, they're not a great predator because they eat everything, including each other. But you may not know that these are very important predators. This paper wasp, this yellow jacket, they feed their young meat. They have to feed their young meat so their young will develop. So the meat that they feed their, to their young are things like caterpillars or red-headed pine sawflies and other sawflies, which we would call plant pests. And of course, don't forget that insects are just small animals. So they exhibit exactly the same predaceous behavior as this predator or this predator or this predator. They're just in a smaller package. They are meat eaters if they're a predator, but then we also have parasites. Now you will commonly hear and read, you know, that we want to, to use a parasite to control other insects, but look at this, a parasite, biologically speaking, parasites, do not kill their host outright. They're a successful parasite, by the way, doesn't kill its host. This Asian tiger mosquito, you know, yes, I took a risk, you know, when it was biting me, that it could have given me a, an encephalitic virus, right? Oh, well, that's a risk. But that mosquito didn't have in its little mosquito mind spreading a virus. In fact, what it has in its mind is just getting a little blood meal 
to help mature its eggs. They do not want to kill their host. They don't want to kill us. The virus is just taking advantage of the situation. So the bottom line is this. If we try to use a parasite, an insect parasite, in fact, there are very few insect parasites that parasitize other insects. But if we wanted to use them, they wouldn't be very successful because the definitions of a successful parasite is it doesn't kill its host. So then we have this third rail. A parasitoid is actually a subset of a parasite that kills its host, often eating it from the inside. And what you're seeing on this catalpa hornworm on the saddleback caterpillar are not eggs. These are cocoons of a parasitoid wasp. So things happened inside. There's a human parasitoid. Boy, that dates me if you know the movie that this goes to. So parasitoid wasp and catalpa hornworm, we're going to talk about that which happens to be the same parasitoid wasp that attacks tomato and tobacco hornworms. Hornworms come from this, uh, the common name comes from this horn, this projection on the uh, posterior end of the caterpillar. They all grow up to be these beautiful moths called sphinx moths that belong to the family Sphingidae. And here is a catalpa hornworm. It does feed on its named host plant only on catalpas. I mentioned a while ago, these are really good fish bait, not to drift off too far, but I actually grew up that this is how you got your dinner because these will guarantee that you'll catch a bass or two or three. So it is directly tied to its host plant. But what's happening here? I just told you what's happened inside this caterpillar is that the immature wasp larvae have completely stripped out this caterpillar. They actually spend most of their development not feeding on anything that would kill the caterpillar because if they did, they'd all die, right? But once they complete their development, once the larvae come to the surface to pupate, they first come to the surface, pop through and spin up this silk cocoon inside which they pupate. This is the work of one female wasp. And by the way, these wasps are called, uh, they, they, their reproduction is called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenic means there are no males. The females that will emerge from these cocoons don't have to mate to do the same thing. So you can see out of this one caterpillar, there will be a bunch of new females that will go to other caterpillars and you'll just get the domino effect. It turns out catalpa hornworms have two generations per year. And we often see this. The number of caterpillars in the first generation, normally it's reversed. Normally, when you have two generations a year, the second generation is much larger. It turns out this pair, and there's been a lot of publications on this, it's one of the very early uh, uh, models used for a, a, uh, a host parasitoid uh, modeling. Uh, and it turns out the second generation typically has lower number of, of, of caterpillars because of what happened in the first generation. It just gets better. But you may be thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, Joe, that, that caterpillar is still crawling around. It's still feeding. It's dead and just doesn't know it yet. I'm getting better. No, you're not. You'll be stone dead in a moment. As a matter of fact, this is that same caterpillar. I knocked some of the cocoons off so you could see it. Uh, this is the same caterpillar about an hour later. It was dead. So what's actually going on here? Well, there's the little wasp. Her name is Catessa, Catesia congregata, Catesia congregata. That's her scientific name. She's a very, very nice little thing. And she has an ovipositor, ova egg layer, which of course for other hymenoptera serves as a stinger, as a defense weapon. But in her case, it's being used to oviposit, to lay eggs. Hi. It's a very nice little wasp. And here's, she's gonna do her work. Wow! <laughs> So what just happened? Well, what happened if we opened up? First, she laid eggs. Well, we all know that. That's what, you know, the ovipositor did. What was another thing she did? She injected venom. Well, we know that too, because if you get stung by a wasp, which by the way, these are too small to really sting you at all. But if you get stung by a wasp, the thing that causes the burning sensation is the venom that's injected. But there were also two other things that she did. The other thing is she injected a virus and these cells that were attached, let me go back. These cells that were attached to the eggs called teratocytes. So what do these things do? Well, the virus suppresses the immune system so that there's no rejection of eggs and teratocytes. 
insects do have an immune system just like us as we're taking advantage of to combat the coronavirus, right? That's our immune system being jacked up once we get vaccinated. Well, the same thing, insects have the same thing. They can reject things that invade them, but the virus suppresses that. The teratocytes release a hormone called T hormone that in conjunction with the venom suppress development. So the caterpillar doesn't pupate. Now you gotta think about that for a minute. Why is that important? Well. If there were immature wasp larvae inside this caterpillar and it pupated, everything would get scrambled. I mean, it would be a disaster for the wasp larvae. So it's a good idea for the caterpillar to stay a caterpillar as long as the parasitoid wasps are inside of it. But there's something about this whole story that quite frankly, and I'm sharing this with you because let's face it, the one thing that's just wonderful about gardening about what you do, why you're listening to me drone on here, is that you're always learning something new, but only if, you've question, if you question what you're learning. So I didn't question, I just, okay, it injects a virus. And I never thought, well, wait a minute, it inject, where does this virus come from? I never thought about that before. Where does it come from? Once again, let's consult the literature. Journal of Virology, published when? 2014, and they're referring to parasitoid wasp, Catesia congregata, this little friendly wasp that has a biological weapon that's integrated into the wasp's genome. Now, I'm gonna let that sink in just for a second because the scientists that eventually discovered this went looking for the virus. They could not find the virus on the surface of the wasp. They could not find the virus inside the wasp. They couldn't find the virus on the surface of the ovipositor. They could find it inside the ovipositor, but only inside the ovipositor. So where in the world did it come from? Integrated into the wasp genome means the virus came right out of the wasp's own DNA. Think about that. I mean, it's mind blowing. So here we have the larvae coming to the surface, popping through, and there's a little hemolymph, a little bit of the insect's blood that leaks out, and these larvae are now spinning up their cocoons. Again, as I said, death is not immediate. Some damage does occur, but feeding is reduced. And this is the same parasitoid wasp that shows up on tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm. By the way, even though we think of these tomato hornworm as being what we find on our tomatoes in greater Cincinnati, we most commonly see tobacco hornworm. You can see they're in the same genus, Manduca. And by the way, tomatoes are closely related to tobacco. They're all in the Solanaceae family. So they're Solanaceous plants. Remember I said taxonomy is important. So of course, you know, here we have the disappearing tomato leaves. Sadly, these are my own tomatoes and you know, <laughs> I've always thought, how dare they? I'm an entomologist. You're damaging my tomatoes. What do you think is going to happen? But it is amazing how hard it is to see these caterpillars until you finally, I mean, they look pretty obvious when they're by themselves, but mixed in, it's hard to find them. So there's Catesia congregata. There is on a tobacco hornworm, you see the cocoon sprouting forth. Now these tobacco hornworms are the same age. Remember what happened with the T hormone? I mean, and, and the, um, hang on for a second. I'm sorry, I, I should have muted my phone. Uh, remember what happened in terms of suppression and development. This just shows that this caterpillar is being suppressed because it's parasitized. This one wasn't. It turns out Catesta congregata has the common name, the hornworm wasp. It's actually pretty unusual for a parasitoid to attack multiple hosts. Normally, they, they have to synchronize because you think about how they evolve with a single host. But in this case, actually, uh, they're everywhere. They attack a lot of different hornworms. Well, back to beneficial insects. We've already said this. At Animated Beauty, one third of our food supply does depend on pollinators and insects are involved. Remember, flies are the second most important pollinator. Predators and parasitoids, they prey on other insects. But just to kind of re-emphasize the point because we're often asked, what good are insects? What good are periodical cicadas? Well, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of good because insects are keystone organisms in all terrestrial ecosystems. 
This is an extremely important point. Keystone organ. What is a keystone? Well, I have a little graphic just to demonstrate it. If you look at the arch, actually it was not invented by the Romans. It wasn't invented by the Greeks. It predated all that, but they all borrowed on it. But we're going to use some Romans to demonstrate it. Here we have a phalanx coming up. They're underneath the keystone, and we're going to demonstrate it by pulling that keystone. And you can see what they're saying. Uh, here we go. Ah, oh, crap. Ah. So when you pull a keystone, the entire arch collapses. And that is why we use the word keystone organism. All terrestrial ecosystems would collapse if we removed insects. Think about that. We would have a very tough lie, a life existing if we didn't have insects. Of all things, for me to demonstrate why ben insects are actually beneficial, this to me should really hit home hard for all of us. But some insects are pests. We cannot deny that. Now, this brings me to a point that I knew but didn't know. I knew it for years, but I didn't know it. <laughs> what I mean by that? Well, I do these monthly diagnostic walkabouts. Actually, I've been having to do them virtually with, uh, uh, with the pandemic, but for 23 years, once a month for the green industry, we go out and walk around. One of our favorite places is at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. For those of you who have known, I mean, if you ever get Steve Foltz, I think he's taught in this program before, wonderful speaker, director of horticulture at Cincinnati Zoo, actually Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. Wonderful place to go see things. But there was something about the zoo that was very interesting. So here are these diagnostic walkabouts. Here's Steve leading it. Years ago, I started noticing something. <laughs> there were very few plant pests at the zoo. The zoo does not apply any insecticides. I mean, the only insecticides they've ever used there was to try to maintain some of their ash trees. Of course, those are systemic insecticides but they do not spray at the zoo. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, they don't spray. That's obvious. They don't want to expose the, in the animals to insecticides. That's not the reason. They don't have to spray. When we would walk around during these walkabouts, I started noticing, man, I, I had very little to say, which Gigi would say, that's a miracle. The point being is I had very little to say because I would look hard for pests and not find them. And finally, I mean, it's been to the place for the last 10 years that, Steve is primarily talking about plant selection, and I'm just kind of tagging along, looking hard for something to say. Why is that? Why was I finding very few insects at the zoo, very few insect pests at the zoo? Well, let's get right down to it and connect some dots. Let's get to the main point of this presentation. And as I said, I should have known the answer. I shouldn't have had to contemplate it because three people that I know very well have been involved with the research that has aimed towards something called disasters by design. Paula Shrewsbury and Mike Rapp are both, well, actually Mike is now a professor emeritus. He's retired, but he's still very active. He's married to Paula. They're at the University of Maryland. Dan Herms was our department chair uh, uh, for OSU entomology. He now works for Davy Tree. But they did these pivotal papers, particularly this one, Disasters by design, outbreaks along urban gradients. Ecology of herbivorous arthropods in urban landscapes. These are pivotal research papers leading to the crescendo that I'm hoping to make today, but look at the dates. And I, I had these papers and I actually heard Dan and Mike give talks that should have told me why I wasn't finding pests insect pests at the zoo, but I, I wasn't paying as enough attention. I wasn't thinking about it hard enough, but that's what I'm doing for you, hopefully, is to say, all right, let's really look at the practical application of this work. Let's look at disasters by design, outbreaks along urban gradients. What do we mean by this? Urban gradients, we start with forests with a tremendous, a tremendous amount of diversity. Then we start whittling them down. We start, you know, building, taking down trees. Suburbia is where the developer bulldozes out the trees and then names the streets after them. And we see this all the time. Ashdale Court. Of course, we know what happened to the ash trees. But point being is this 
is about 10 miles from where I live. Where this bulldozer is running is right where these houses are. And back there is what remains of the forest. And look what they named the street, Woodview. You know, I keep threatening to go there and add to that sign, Woodview went away instead of Woodview way. So then we whittle them down. These two trees were here before the parking lot. They were part of this forest back here. Same with this tree. This tree was kept, you know, whittled down. Everything was, you know, uh, you can see what's happening. This big oak tree it was probably kept for providing shade until it dies and falls over on the cars. But the point of it is, is that this is what we do. We start whittling things down. I mean, it's no one's fault. It's, well, it's a bad joke. But at any rate, monoculture is by a natural selection. Here we have, this is actually my neighborhood. It was a cornfield for over 80 years before these houses were put in here. But at one time it was a forest and now it's being slowly reforested with much less diversity. This parking lot has only four species of trees throughout it, only four. Sometimes we just put one tree way up on the highway. So here's a, a, a graphic depiction have high diversity in our forest, then we go to first, uh, uh, the first level reduction, second level reduction, and finally monoculture. This entire parking lot only has one species, calorie pear. Pretty big parking lot, monoculture. So we keep whittling down. Now, Steve Foltz depicts it this way, and I like this. We start with a natural, highly diverse situation then we go into suburban which is a little bit less obviously a lot less and then we go into urban what's happening each step down we have less diversity actually it looks a little more like this doesn't it high diversity much less diversity so what's the relationship between the abundance and diversity of plants and the diversity of arthropod pests well paula and mike took a look at 212 landscapes on average the low diversity they called three species per landscaping on average, uh, the high diversity landscapes had 38 species. And here's the table that developed out of that. Now, in terms of general predators, look at this, general predators. In simple, simple three species landscapes uh, compared to 38, uh, what was that, 38? I think it was 30, yeah, 38, 38 complex landscapes. Now, for those that know statistics, you know that if I take this number, 2.6, and add to that number, 13.1, and I take this number and subtract from 21.8, and if the two cross, then these aren't cons considered to be statistically different numbers, but it's clearly they are statistically different. Generalist predators, same with spiders. Plant pests, less pests, statistically different. Then they went one step further. Now, we can't do very well with azalea lace bugs growing azaleas here. I said that in reverse, didn't I? As an entomologist, we can't do well growing azaleas, but in Maryland, they can do very well. And azalea lace bug is a big pest, produces stippling damage that can really cause great harm to the tree. So they looked at azaleas. Number of lace bugs in a simple, and now here's something else statistically. If this next bar that I'm gonna show, if it overlaps with this T, if they overlap, then they're not statistically different. I think they're statistically different. I actually had to make this bigger so you could even see the number of lace bugs in complex versus simple. What is going on there? What's going on is just simply, again, mind blowing. Because they also took a look at adding and subtracting. So they looked at number of natural enemies with only azaleas, and they say no flowers. Well, azaleas bloom, but they don't draw in a lot of pollinators. And there are the number of natural enemies with just azaleas. But then they added, in another landscaping, coriander. Just one flower. What just happened to the number of natural enemies, enemies of other insects, enemies of insect pests? What just happened? They went up. Then they just added another flower, Shasta daisy. What just happened? Compared to no flowers. What is going on here? Well, we're going to connect the, connect the dots further because it's clear that flower power equals natural enemies. And by the way, these are the females that came out of this wasp or, or the, uh, these cocoons. These are the little tiny wasps. 
what do the female wasps eat? Have to consider that. What do they eat? Well, they eat nectar. And because of nectar, then they're able to have energy to go off. And of course, this is, is actually a different, these are different species, but these are the same species of wasps. The point of is, all parasitoid wasps have to have nectar. They have to visit flowers. This is a pretty interesting little uh, uh, a wasp. It's called a stink bug hunter. What does it go after? It goes after things like the nymphs of brown marmorated stink bugs. What do the female wasps eat? Nectar. One of my favorite little flies, just because it's kind of a pretty little fly. It's called a feather leg fly because there's feather like structures on their hind legs. It is a parasitoid of true bugs, back to brown marmorateds. What do the fly, adult flies eat? They eat nectar. What is the common theme? And we look at predators. These are surfed flies or hover flies. Now, how do we know they're flies and not bees? Because they only have two wings, diptera. Their maggots eat aphids. These are predators. So they eat aphids, but they're also pollinators. Look at them around this prairie rose. You will also find them with knockout roses. Even though sometimes people will say, well, wait a minute, roses don't attract anything. You need to consider which rose, because it is true. Hybrid tea roses have been bred away from attracting pollinators. And this is a cautionary tale. It's something we're trying to make sure that plant breeders, those that, those that go out to select for horticultural interest, are not forgetting that as they keep moving plants towards a place where they have horticultural interest, they may be losing the interest of pollinators. Now, I'm not denigrated hybrid teas. I actually like hybrid teas. They've gotten me out of my tr trouble with my wife numerous times. The point being is, I'm not telling you to not plant hybrid teas. I'm only saying, though, okay, it's a cautionary tale on what could happen. And oh, by the way, you know, the knockout roses have their origins in non native roses. So this brings up this whole thing well, do non native plants, are they good for? It? Yes, non native plants will attract pollinators. I'll give a good example, goldenrod soldier beetle. The larvae live in the soil, feed on insect eggs and insect larvae. So the goldenrod soldier beetles, there's actually more than one species, I will tell you, they have larvae that are highly predaceous. And when we say corn, when we say rootworms, here's a good example. One name for this beetle is the spotted cucumber beetle. The other name is southern corn rootworm. It can be very damaging to corn. What feeds on it? What depletes the larvae of this are the larvae of this. This is a very important predator. What the adult eats, the, the adults eat pollen and nectar. Here they are on wing stem. This is a Pennsylvania leather wing, goldenrod. But look at this golden rain tree. Golden rain tree is not native to Ohio. It's not native to the United States. It's become naturalized in the South. Some people think it's native, but it's not. Golden chain tree is not native. Yet if you put a golden rain tree out in your landscaping, I will guarantee you it will, it will just be buzzing with pollinators. So once again, we have to kind of get away from this idea. Lindens, a little leaf linden, is it native? No, it's not native, but you see a lot of pollinators on it. Southern magnolia is not called Ohio, called Ohio magnolia. Point being is, Non-natives do attract pollinators. They attract nectar feeders. Here's Egyptian star cluster, nice uh, bumblebee. Does, did dahlias start in Cincinnati? No, they didn't. They do attract pollinators. And that's important in this message because we don't, it's all about diversity, we're trying to say. We're trying to make sure you understand plant diversity is very important. Thread-wasted wasp. Digs burrows, provisions larvae with paralyzed caterpillars and sawfly larvae. These can be plant pests. These are the larval food items. You just see over and over what the adults eat, nectar. And of course, we have misunderstood stingers like paper wasps and bald-faced hornets and yellow jackets. The little larvae in here have to be fed meat. The females feed their larvae meat so that the larvae, this one is grinding up this caterpillar. Unfortunately, it is parasitized. It is a catapult hornworm. It's going to take this meatball back to feed its immatures. 
But what do the females themselves eat? They are pollinators. They feed on pollen and nectar. Another two for pollinator and predator. We have a lot of different types. I'm kind of advancing forward. So connect the dots, putting it all together, flower power. And we're gonna use a very quickly, I'm not gonna run out of time and I actually have to do a radio show at noon so I can't be on overtime, but flower power pest management case study, we're gonna use bagworms. This is not bagworms. These are not bagworms, but I grew up in West Virginia and we commonly heard these called bagworms because these look like bagworms in the tree, look like bags in the tree. This is a bagworm. There's a little caterpillar in here and we'll open it up when you see the caterpillar creates kind of like a silk sock and it attaches parts of the host plant to the outside of it. So that's what it looks like. I guess if you look like that, you live in a bag too. But the point of it is, is if we look at integrated pest management, a concept that's been around since 1967. You could spray for bag worms, but there are, there's a problem with spraying. The problem is what we call asynchronous development and attach that to the early, the small caterpillars are most susceptible to insecticides. So these bagworms were collected off the same host the same day. Look at the differences in development. These are probably more, well, these are definitely more susceptible. As a matter of fact, once we get to this stage, they drop out of being susceptible to Bacillus thuringiensis. Once you get to this stage, even the traditional insecticides have a problem. So that's kind of a challenge. We say it's problematic. What about cultural management? There's a great direct approach. Right now, the females are dead, but they can be full of anywhere from 500 to 1500 eggs. So we could use digital IPM tool and there's a picture of it. You pluck off the bagworms, you have them in your hand, you put them in a bag, it's a bag of bagworm. And then I'm gonna show you a two-step bagworm control method. Step one, position the bagworms on a hard surface. Now these are bags that have active caterpillars. Now, if there are any small children, you got to have them leave the area of your computer because this next is gonna be rated TVMA for violence because you're gonna stomp on them. Stomp, there's no coming back from this. This was their last thing that they ever saw. And at the end of the day, it is a great, a great way to control. So by the way, I should say this. So far, no populations of bagworms have ever become resistant to this control method. You could also set them on fire, not on the plant, pull them off and set them on fire, but you gotta be careful working with the fire. I'm sorry, I love this movie. I always put this in. Just be careful if you're working with fire. Finally, let's go biological. What's happening right here? This is in a Christmas tree plantation where I could find no active bagworms, but I did find two bald-faced hornets' nests. Those hornets use their very powerful mandibles to rip the caterpillars out of the bags to bring back to feed to their young. That's predation in action. So that's a twofer. You may not know this. I mean, if you look closely, you'll often see bald-faced hornets and yellow jackets coming to flowers for nectar more flower power. So what you're seeing here is an exit hole of a parasitoid wasp. And so I open up the bag of another, another bagworm, and this is Idoplectus conquistator. There's a little female wasp. She's you know fully developed, so I put her on my finger and she popped her wings out, and there's her ovipositor. So here's a publication, factors affecting the survival of larval and pupil stages of bagworm. The ichnomonid, Idoplectus conquistator, accounted for most of the parasitism, almost 76%. And here's another very important paper. Parasitism rates of bagworms were 71% higher in shrubs that were surrounded by flowering forbs than in shrubs that lack flowers. It even gets better. In a third experiment, parasitism rates exceeded 70% in shrubs that were adjacent to central bed of flowering forbs, but less than 40% and shrubs that were further away. What am I saying to you? First, science is pretty cool, but secondly, flower power equals natural enemies. This isn't just a pollinator garden, it's a pest management garden. It's an ecological approach to plant pest management. The bottom line is you increase flowering diversity in your landscaping, you will have less pests. You will do what I observed at the zoo for over 
15 years now. You just don't find pests there because of the diversity. Well, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. I know that's a bad one. It's my only Marxism. I hope I kept your attention. I, oh, well, but we're getting close to the end. So you can all get up and start dancing and everything. But we do have a final overarching point. Diversify landscapes because flower power equals pest management power, except for the darn flies. Flower power equally, equally, equals pest management power. And if you reduce, if you increase the diversity, I'm sorry, if you increase the diversity of flowers, you are going to have fewer pests in all kinds of different situations, in all these different situations. And don't forget about trees. We want! I'm just... We want! A shrubbery! <laughs> God, I had that in there. Don't forget trees and shrubs. One of my favorites is this button bush. Look at the flower on that. It's a great pollinator attractor. And what does that flower remind you of? Oh, who knew? Spirea with the hoverfly, fragrant sumac with attracting bees, eastern red bud. I mean, all of these different service berries that you get to eat the fruit. Don't forget trees and shrubs are also very important for this great diversity of flowering plants in your landscaping, not the least of which Ohio buckeye and the Ohio State buckeye, Escalunius natosa. It's all about increasing flowering plant diversity. I'm not presenting though a recipe, you decide. It's your garden, natives, non-native varieties, cultivars, just increase diversity. The true voyage of discovery lies not in finding new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And hopefully compound eyes are part of your new perception. Oh, thank you, Gigi. I didn't know you had this it. open for, for applause. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. And again, I apologize. I'm going to have to get off of here in about five minutes so I can go to a radio show. But uh, do we have any quick questions? I do not have any in the chat. But people are saying thanks, things that they hadn't thought of before. Ask Joe what he thinks about lawns. What do I think about lawns? Well, you know, I like the, the, I like the quote, and I wish I knew. Jim Chatfield first shared this with me. Maybe you heard Jim teach before. Uh, Turf grass is the canvas upon which we paint the rest of the landscaping. So, Catherine, think about what I just said there. You know, turf grass has a place. If you go to some different places, I mean, think of anything else that you can walk on and not kill it. But it's the canvas. And just like, you know, we don't expect a nice painting to be a blank canvas, do we? Although I think in the past, some sold that way, right? We kind of wondered how that happened. Point being is you start off and then you start bringing in landscaping. It's a great way to walk around. Um, to look at things and we see this in our parks very often right i love this uh, that you can go to different parks and you see a beautiful land and you're walking on turf grass between the plants i personally don't think the turf grass even though it's one of my areas of specialization i don't think it should dominate the landscaping it does have its place and you really won't find also another plant that does a better job in in what we call bioswales so if you're trying to reduce stormwater uh, runoff, frankly, turf grass is fantastic. It's used commonly for that. So, you know, use it where it's appropriate. Uh, but, you know, I'm trying to, I mean, gee, gee, I just really, I'm trying to convince a bunch of avid gardeners, uh, you know, you need to put more flowering plants in your, in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> that should be an easy sell, shouldn't it? I'm looking is at the public the radio. Is the public radio show program available? But yeah, you should be able to listen to it in just a minute. It's WVXU. So, and as a matter of fact, it's about one minute away. And I told them I'd be a little bit late because I, I told them I was ruining another group. I mean, I was teaching another group of people. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things. So if okay. it's okay, then I'm going to leave. And thank you all for putting up with me once again. Thank you, Joe, for joining us. And if you are available, jump over to, over to WVXU and catch Joe for round two. And others. 
<laughs> All right, take care. Thank you, everyone. I will be sending out the YouTube link so that you can follow up on previous episodes or catch this one. Um, some of you were trying to take notes. I was getting messages in the chat, um, but that way you can share them with your fellow friends also and learn more about what is going on with our uh, perennial gardens. Have a great day. It appears that the rain has stopped here and we're supposed to have a nice weekend. So get out there and enjoy it. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks, Gigi.